Georgetown Steam Plant. Uh, my name is Kelsey Wildstone, and uh, I'm an electrical engineer um, here in the Seattle area. Um, so, just a, a first thing about uh, safety. You know, the people at the front probably told you you have to watch your head on low hanging things like this. Um, you know, there's a lot of climbing in places in the, the floor. Uh, don't turn it into knobs or dials. I mean, because some of them will still leak oil. Uh -huh. It's an old, old facility, and so uh, it was not built to the latest code, so we just have to keep that in mind. Um, one thing, though, I, I like to tell people uh, about the Georgetown Steam Plant is that it's owned by Seattle City Light. And so if you're a rate payer of Seattle City Light, it's kind of like you're a partial owner of the steam plant, since Seattle City Light is uh, one of the nation's uh, first publicly known utilities. Uh, and with that, I'd like to ask you to treat it like the most valuable thing that you own, because it probably is. <laughs> um, so, get a couple of my notes here. So the Georgetown Steam Plant uh, was first built in uh, 1906, and we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, it was built, why it was built, and um, why you should care. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask you a couple of things um, about electricity. It's uh, one of those things that we interact with all the time, and most likely don't really ever think about. You know, I just I go over to you know a light bulb, and when I, I pull a cord, you know I expect it to go off and on. And, just that's that, right? Um, and so when we think about the, say, the inventor of the light bulb, what name comes to mind? Edison, yeah, right? A lot of people think of Edison. It's really a trick question, though, because Edison didn't actually invent the light bulb. Sorry to tell you, but, um, you know, incandescent lighting had been invented some 80 years before Edison came along. But there's a, a picture of Edison uh, holding his uh, signature invention. What Edison did, and if you look at the actual patent, you know, he did a patent for improving incandescent light. He basically Henry Forded the light bulb, right? He wanted to make it practical and affordable um, for the everyday person. So, um, Edison filed his uh, first patent for incandescent light in October 14th, uh, 1878. Um, and if you actually want to know uh, who is credited for first creating incandescent light, Humphrey Davy is uh, credited for uh, first uh, creating incandescent light by passing current through the platinum strip that he used in the film. And now you can understand, like, you know, platinum, a platinum light bulb is not very practical and affordable. Who wants to pay $200 for a light bulb, right? Uh, so we needed a, a slightly better solution. Um, Edison uh, debuted an incandescent light bulb that uh, used a, a carbon filament. Um, he did some other designs, you know, like a, a paper horseshoe uh, kind of design, and eventually, um, you know, so the carbon filament lasted a, a whopping 40 hours. Right? So that was that was uh, something for the time. And then uh, by the summer of 1880, um, his researchers at Mineral Park uh, made a breakthrough uh, with the um, carbonized bamboo. <laughs> Um, and uh, you know their uh, their paper horseshoe could last uh, 600 hours, and so that was a, a big breakthrough. Um, and then of course you know if you look at light bulb technology through the years, you know, we've changed a lot to where now we even have LED light bulbs that last 55,000 hours, right? So I mean a lot of developments. When you think about the light bulb; it's not something that's been a, a static invention even over the last hundred years. One of the things, though, that Edison knew about his new invention was he couldn't just stop there. You can't just create the light bulb without electricity or power, right? So uh, this is where we enter the legendary Pearl Street Station. Um, and this is in Manhattan. And uh, if you look at this bottom right photo down here, the red circle was the service area for the Pearl Street Station. Now you might notice that map is of Manhattan. It's uh, you know basically south tip of Manhattan, and um, he placed it there partly because that was where the New York Times was located. It's also kind of the financial district, and he's, he knew that if he put it there, then he would get good press. And sure enough, the New York Times um, placed across the, the front page. You know the age of electricity is here. And of course, you know buried on page seven. It's like well, it's a lot like gaslighting, but maybe a little bit softer. Um, 
So this began operation on September 4th, uh, 1882, and really launched the electric power industry. So uh, first permanent central station uh, to supply incandescent lighting. And in order to do this, he had to install six jumbo dynamo, dynamo generators. That's what's shown up here on the, the top left. Each one of these guys weighed 27 tons, and it was only enough to uh, produce about 100 kilowatts, which is about 1,200 light bulbs. So <laughs> massive machines for, for not that much. And as I said, you know, the, the surface area for all of these machines is just a little little circle there in Manhattan. You have to dig up you know, the whole city to install these conduits uh, underground and, and run all kinds of electric uh, wires. Um, I have this uh, interesting tip here, by the way, of, about light bulbs, just because uh, like when I, I went and kind of did some research for this, I also tried to get uh, light bulbs for the steam plant. And so this one back here, you can see the nice, really uh, defined glass tip. Um, and that is a reproduction bulb that's actually most appropriate for the steam plant. Um, the, the glass tip is where they would use uh, vacuum to, to pull all of the air out of the light bulbs in order to uh, make that filament uh, burn. And um, that glass tip, would show up uh, in light bulbs until about 1919. Um, 1907 uh, light bulbs uh, were, were positively high tech with this uh, straight wire tungsten filament. And uh, you see that in a lot of the, the, the fancy restaurants now and they're trying to go with the vintage light bulbs. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, kind of the, the GE Mazda bulb and it was a, a, a big breakthrough for Edison's kind of first designs with the, the paper horseshoe filaments that I mentioned. Okay, so, um, Brings us to Seattle, right? So, you know, we're here in the George Town Sea Point, we're in Seattle, why do we care what Edison did in New York? Uh, in 1886, the Edison backed Seattle Electric uh, Lighting Company installed a reciprocating engine in a shed on uh, Jack near Jackson Street uh, in Pioneer Square that powered a dynamo to produce uh, direct current for uh, a few nearby customers at handful of street lights. Uh, and this is one of the first uh, since, uh, systems uh, west of the uh, Rocky Mountains for incandescent lighting. Um, one of the problems with DC, though, that I, I want to mention um, is we said that it would lose potency over distance. So if you had a DC station, did anybody know what DC means when I say that? Direct current. Yeah, I see some hands. Okay, so direct current would lose uh, voltage over certain certain uh, lengths. And so um, we had this thing in electrical engineering we call voltage drop, um, and so you know more than, say, like 20 miles away. It just wasn't really useful. You know, the lights would just get dimmer, 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 and so it was just, you know, just one practical. Uh, so does anybody know what the competing solution or the, the person that has developed the competing solution in the game is kind of like? Westinghouse. Westinghouse, and what is it, what is it? Tesla. All right, so both of those are correct. Tesla was the inventor, and Westinghouse was the businessman that bought his patents and backed him. Um, so uh, in the mid-1880s, the um, in 1887, Nikola Tesla uh, developed the uh, complete system of generators, transformers, uh, and, and you know, three phase motors and things like this, um, alternating current um, that could go much further than direct current. And in uh, 1895, uh, the Westinghouse Electric Manufacturing Company um, bought many of those patents, and they were able to, to prove this technology in 1895 when uh, they installed three Tesla-designed hydroelectric generators uh, at Niagara Falls. And they were able to pump um, you know, alternating current by wire uh, 20, 20 miles away uh, to Buffalo, which is something that DC couldn't really do at the time. Um, like I said, you know, that kind of distance would have just you know, kind of petered out. Um, so alternating current really became uh, America's standard for, for most purposes, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to show you this, this real quick graphic here you know, when I talk about uh, AC systems. So this kind of gives you an idea of how the whole system is designed. You have a, a generation station here on the left, and then at the generating station you have a step-up transformer that uh, ramps up that voltage to a very high level, um, and then you have uh, you know transmission lines uh, and when you see those those lines that are real high in the sky, you know, 100 feet up with the giant towers and those transmission lines, um, those are you know going to be somewhere in the order of 100,000 volts, uh, very high voltage, and allows us to 
um, carry those transmission lines uh, for a very long distance. And then when we get to uh, more residential neighborhoods, we have a, a step-down transformer or you know, substations that lower that voltage down uh, to those nearby neighborhoods and kind of distribute those voltages at different levels for commercial, residential, uh, and even industrial customers. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of why that EC system was um, you know, worthwhile or, or why it worked for uh, distances that are further away. So uh, now that we've set the stage for uh, electricity and kind of how some of that stuff start guarded, started in, in America and even here in Seattle, uh, we're going to talk about uh, this site and a little bit more about Seattle history and how this kind of, kind of shaped up. So we're going to go out this door right here and uh, walk to the end of the page. Okay, so we can talk about uh, Seattle and some of the early history here and about how some of this stuff uh, came about. Um, when we think of some of the first European settlers of Seattle, what names come to mind? Denny, Denny. yeah, Denny. right? I mean, I think of the Denny party, maybe think of Yasur and some other things like that. Well, that's uh, kind of another trick question because I could argue that the Denny party was actually beat by the Collins party. Um, see, because uh, while Denny Party technically arrived at Alki Point um, two days earlier um, than the Collins Party, you know they were at Alki Point, and it was uh, if you guys have ever been, you know Alki Point, just on the beach in the winter, uh, it's kind of a, a rough neighborhood in terms of weather. Can you imagine being out there in a tent and just kind of getting slammed by the wind? So not that great. Meanwhile, the Collins Party two days later arrived here in Georgetown uh, in September 16th uh, of 1851. The Collins Party were much more successful in creating permanent, you know, they created a permanent building and a whole little community here in Georgetown uh, where, like I said, the Denny Party had some trouble at Alki Point and it was a year later that they moved to their present day uh, known location of Pioneer Square. So. Georgetown is, you know, really Seattle's oldest neighborhood, um, and uh, it's, you know, been here a little bit longer than than uh, the Denny Party. Anybody know what uh, Georgetown's biggest business was back then? Any guesses? Uh, beer. Beer. Yeah, I tell people, guys, it's either prostitution or alcohol. I mean, it's, it's a short list. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was beer. Uh, in 1884, uh, Sweeney's Brewery began operations in the big red brick building that you see along Airport Way. Um, some people think of it as the Rainier Beer, uh, Rainier Building. Uh, that's because uh, they combined later to the, the uh, Seattle Brewery and Malting uh, Beverage that later became known for their signature product, Rainier Beer. And uh, they, they did actually a lot of the brewery and the, the plant here in Georgetown. The building along I-5 that people think of the Rainier building was actually used more for bottling operations uh, based on what I, I can find. So um, kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the brewery was really the largest industry around here. It's the largest source of income, the largest employer. And um, there's, there's a little bit of a, a story that when uh, Georgetown Incorporated in 1904, uh, they, they did it to sort of uh, skirt around some of the, the King County uh, laws at the time because King County wanted to go dry. And Georgetown said, no, we don't think so. Um, we're just going to incorporate and keep our, our own laws here. And uh, anybody uh, have any idea who they elected as the first mayor? No? No guesses, huh? The brewery superintendent. <laughs> um, yeah, he was also like the police chief, the fire chief, um, you know, yeah. So kind of one-stop shopping there. All right, so side note, also uh, some people ask me how Georgetown got its name. Um, does the, the name Dexter Horton ring a bell to anybody? Yeah, see the Dexter Horton building in Seattle? Well, Dexter's brother Julius was a land developer and he actually bought the original um, homestead from the Collins family. Um, he bought that in 1871 and in 1890 named the city after his son, George. So that's where Georgetown comes from. 
Okay, so. This right here uh, is a claim map, by the way, just to kind of give you some idea. I told you about uh, Georgetown being established here. This is an early photo of Georgetown on, on the top right. Um, Georgetown was uh, was quickly becoming, um, you know, I'm sorry, Seattle was, was uh, quickly becoming a uh, very modern city. Um, and transportation got to be very important. You know, then just as it is now, right? You know, we all need to get to work and and uh, go around to our, our jobs and places. And uh, as you might imagine, especially before even some of the whole regrades that you hear about, you know, Seattle had a lot of hills, a lot of mud and muck, and uh, horses pulling uh, streetcars were not really the the best method. You can see these horses pulling these streetcars up here. Uh, you know, if it rained, it, they'd get stuck and so forth. Um, so by March of 1889, a guy named Frank Osgood had the first electric streetcar system west of the Mississippi. And as it turned out, and you can see the streetcar down here, as it turned out, these were actually able to prove their reliability just... It's a pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> um, these were able to uh, prove their reliability just three months later when they rattled on uninterrupted and pretty much undamaged during the Great Seattle Fire. Um, after that, the public really started to understand why electricity was valuable, right? This, this was kind of a new thing. They're like, okay, maybe we're on to something here. And that attracted a flock of investors. Uh, one of these one of these investors um, was a company named um, Stone and Webster out of Boston. They came to Seattle and um, quickly became uh, one of the, the nation's largest conglomerates of electricity and urban transportation. And right around the turn of the century, by uh, you know January 19th, 1990, um, they incorporated in, in uh, the Seattle Electric Company and quickly absorbed uh, 17 smaller electric uh, little generation stations around uh, Pioneer Square um, that were you know usually underfunded or just you know little kind of generating spots. So they started sucking all of these up, and uh, by 1902 they controlled all almost all of the uh, or I'm sorry all of the streetcar companies and almost all of the city's electrical uh, production. Uh, even completed uh, an interurban uh, railway to Tacoma. And so if you've ever seen this statue in Fremont, it's called Waiting for the Interurban. Um, kind of tells you a little bit something about how long they've been waiting there. Um, <laughs> and this kind of shows you a little bit of a system map um, of uh, that, that rail line. So in 1902, about the time that uh, it seemed that Stone and Webster owned everything and they, they were just the, the monopoly crushing the city under its grip. Um, the progressive Seattle voters passed a $590,000 bond measure um, to finance the Cedar River Hydro Plant. Um, this is a big deal because it was the first publicly owned hydroelectric uh, installation in the country and uh, thereby created um, the city lighting department which would later become uh, Seattle City Light. Uh, so the Cedar River installation first supplied um, current to the city in 1905 um, and started taking over uh, some of the city's uh, lighting circuits and so forth and, and began powering uh, some of the city residents. Um, so Stone and Webster's Seattle Electric Company had been able to manage some competition, you know, shortly before that. You know, they had some competition down in Tacoma and so forth. But then, you know, the city uh, putting in this, this Cedar River hydro plant, uh, Seattle Electric Company said, well, hey, you know, we don't like this competition. We want to have the best, most reliable network ever. Uh, make sure that all of the, the customers come to us, right? Because even from, you know, the Edison days of the Pearl Street Station, he had not issued his first bill until he could prove that the system was reliable. So reliability was something that electric companies, or electric customers, rather, had already become to expect. So, Stone and Webster, in order to make sure that, you know, their systems were reliable, say, if, you know, the, the water at their hydroelectric plants got low and they weren't able to generate enough electricity, they wanted to have standby plants, or what we call peaking facilities. Um, so, in 1906, they um, bought 18 acres of land along the Duwamish River to build uh, the Georgetown Steam Plant. So, uh, you guys noticed the Duwamish River uh, when you came in, right? Right over there? Does anybody know why the Duwamish River is not over here anymore? 
They moved it. Yeah. They, they moved a river. You can believe that. Um, yeah, they rechannelized the Duwamish River. And so um, this photo at the top kind of shows you today on the underway, but then this light blue squiggly line is the original path of the Duwamish River. It used to be a nice, you know, winding river like we typically think of rivers. Uh, and they dredged all that up and, and turned uh, that large segment of it into the Duwamish Waterway, um, which is, you know, quite different than a river. Um, <laughs> you can still find the river, it's just a little further up. Um, so, Seattle Electric Company was was not very happy with this when they did rechannelize uh, the the, uh, the river. They, they did that in uh, 1917, and uh, Stone and Webster said, you know, guys, you know, you, you moved the river away, and we were kind of using that water for cooling of our steam plant. So they sued the city of Seattle, and uh, that court case actually went up all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, and they lost that court case. And so they said, okay, well, you know, we, we need to come up with a different solution for, for getting our water. Um, and so if you're ever taking a pleasure cruise along the Duwamish Waterway, uh, the first question I'll ask you is why? Um, because if you have a boat, I mean, I'm sure I could think of other places for you to go. I mean, just saying. But um, you might notice this little building there along the Duwamish Waterway. Um, that is the pump house that Seattle Electric Company had to install uh, in order to get some of the, the cooling water for the, the plant. Uh, and in that building, it um, has uh, two 400 power uh, motor or 400 horsepower Horse motor. Yeah, thank you. Um, horsepower motors um, that are each capable of pumping uh, 13,500 gallons of water per minute. Uh, so pretty impressive, uh, especially for the time. So when we talk about this uh, this building, um, when Seattle Electric Company wanted to uh, to build it, they wanted to find a, an architect, and they uh, found a name uh, a guy named Frank Gilbreth. Does this uh, name ring a bell to anybody? Cheaper by the dozen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got it. So Frank and William Gilbreth were efficiency experts. Um, and they had 13 kids and people asked, uh, well, why do you have 13 kids? And they said, well, they come cheaper by the dozen. And it was one of their kids that actually uh, wrote this book that later became a movie. Um, yeah, so so they were efficiency experts. They would do things like, you know, work with the New York Giants pitching you know, staff to you know, figure out the mechanics of motion and figure out exactly the best way to pitch a ball. Uh, a bricklayer, instead of bending all the way over to pick up their bricks, they said, well, what if we just had a table right here? And the bricklayer just kind of turned instead of bending bend over. Um, you know, a doctor, instead of getting their own tools, could just say scalpel, knife, and expect everybody to rush and get them. Um, <laughs> so they, they do these kinds of things, and, and their kids would even get into it too. You know, um, they would time themselves, like how long it took them to brush their teeth, and, um, you know, when they wanted a new puppy, they would say, well, think of how many happy minutes, minutes it would generate. Um, so <laughs> that, was, that was a thing for this family. Um, it also turns out that uh, um, Frank was something of an expert on, um, you know, uh, fast track construction and uh, some other things like that. Uh, William was uh, the first ever uh, industrial psychologist on a, a postage stamp. Um, so there were some, some cool things like that. So does anybody know what the tallest building in Seattle was in 1906? That one. Right, yeah, I, I heard somebody say it and then stop and then, yeah, and yeah. Well, you are good to stop yourself because that is my, what is that, number two or three trick questions of the day. Um, Smith Tower was not built until 1914. Uh, yeah. So uh, the tallest building in Seattle in 1906 was the Alaska building. Uh, you can see the uh, the Smith Tower there in the background. This is uh, the the Alaska building there, Second and Cherry, uh, completed in 1904. Uh, and this is a, a steel frame um, construction. And this is what they originally uh, considering building uh, the steam plant with. The, the Seattle Times reported on March uh, 30th, 1906, that workers had broken ground for the steam plant, but still had not decided uh, whether it should be made of steel and brick or reinforced concrete. Uh, then on uh, April 18th, 19, uh, 1906, the um, San Francisco uh, was hit by a massive earthquake and uh, it really cemented the decision to use reinforced concrete. 
Yeah, yeah I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so they, uh, they went ahead and used uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, this is some pictures of the San Francisco earthquake right there. Um, reinforced concrete is a lot more uh, stable to uh, seismic conditions. It, it kind of flexes and, and moves a little bit more. Um, and so these are uh, some of the, the construction photos here of, uh, of them doing the steam plant. So it, it also turned out that Frank Gilbreth, the architect, was something of an expert on uh, reinforced concrete and even uh, wrote a book uh, on that. Okay, so um, last thing I'll mention out here is uh, in these photos, you can see these two really big smokestacks that were originally part of the steam plant. See those, those two big uh, smokes towers. Um, anybody know why those aren't here anymore? Airplanes. Airplanes, yeah, yeah. In the 1930s, uh, Boeing uh, Airport came and, uh, you know, they started complaining about these really big things in the sky and we wanted to be nice to the neighbors. And so um, they, they took those down with the latest safety standards of the day. Um, where's my, oh, there it is right there. Were they so Yes, yeah, they were. So you can see right there, um, the workers taking those down. No hard hats, no fall protection, no problems, you know. Uh, so that's kind of kind of interesting. So um, yeah, they took down the um, the uh, the uh, smokestacks and uh, replaced them with um, induced draft fans, which you can see on the top when we walk back uh, around the, the building. Um, the only other thing that I'll point out right here is some of these pictures. You can see there used to be uh, coal elevators on this side of the building. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get up to uh, the boiler room. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the the patches here in the, the building, and uh, those are where the, uh, the smokestacks um, came out. Okay, so we're going to go into the, uh, the engine room and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the equipment inside. Okay, so um, we are in the engine room right now and um, you know Frank Gilbreth, when he designed this building, he kind of uh, had this division of labor going on. So um, there's you know a, uh, a boiler room which we'll, we'll visit um, that produced uh, all the steam. Uh, that then would, would come out here and spin uh, the turbines or, or the engines to produce electricity. Uh, and then you can see some of the electrical equipment over here and up each uh, floor as, as we go through the plant. So, um, you know, as demand for electricity increased, as, as time went on, you know, certainly when you talk about the Pearl Street Station in Manhattan, where land is very expensive, uh, and when, you know, demand increased, you know, you, you would start to encounter uh, limits for both the size and number of generating units that you could put in these, these facilities. Um, you know, there's just a certain point where you, you couldn't keep edging out your neighbors or, you know, there are just the space constraints and so forth. So, um, people were trying to figure out how to make engines either smaller or produce electric more electricity for the same size. Um, the Westinghouse wanted to find the next uh, Westinghouse company wanted to find the, the next best solution and secured patents to uh, the Parsons steam turbine in 1884, uh, and this was really the, the first successful industrial uh, turbine, and it was much smaller. Um, the equal uh, engine generating units, even if not any more efficient, right? So they were able to at least get it in a smaller package. And for nearly a decade, uh, Westinghouse had the upper hand on the market with this uh, this Parsons turbine. Uh, and then in September 1896, a guy named uh, Charles Curtis uh, received patents protecting uh, the, the principles for his uh, Curtis turbine engine. Um, and entered into a licensing agreement with uh, General Electric, uh, which by this time, if you, if you guys uh, know, uh, it used to be called Edison General Electric, but by, with the 1892 merger, they had removed Edison uh, from the name, and of course, um, by this point, you know, they ended their fixation with direct current because it just was not going to work out, and GE also jumped on board with the, the alternating current uh, bandwagon, and at that point it was a direct competitor uh, with Westinghouse. 
So they, they received the patents um, for $1.5 million to use the, Cur uh, the, the Curtis turbine for everything for except for aerial and marine propulsion. Uh, and you can actually see that on the nameplate of that unit when we go up there. Um, the marine propulsion I kind of get, but the aerial propulsion just kind of baffles me. You know, like, do, do these things fit in an airship? I, I'm just... <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, all right, so this uh, graphic right here kind of shows you a size comparison. Um, this is the uh, Curtis um, turbine on the right here. It's a 500 uh, RPM, uh, 5,000 uh, kilowatt unit compared to a reciprocating engine there on the left. Um, I almost feel like I should insert, you know, a total graphic of a person standing there too, just to also help with the uh, sheer size and scale. But you can still look at this unit here and look at the size of this, and then imagine that scaled up however many times, you know, that it's it's, it's really big, right? So, um, a dramatic improvement on, on size. Okay, um, the first unit that you see over here uh, is unit number one. Um, that was installed in uh, 1907 and is a, a three megawatt turbine. Uh, in 1908, uh, unit number two right here uh, was an eight megawatt unit. Um, and I just want to point out, you know, in just a year, they more than doubled the capacity. So you go through a three megawatt year in 1907 to an eight megawatt year. So, you know, three million watts, eight million watts. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, at that, that turn of the century, the, the pace of development is kind of like going from, you know, you know, iPhone 1 to iPhone 2, right? There's a lot of, a lot of improvement in a short amount of time. Um, so, you know, the, the first, um, first Curtis turbine was installed in Schenectady, New York. It was a 500 kilowatt unit. And just to give you an idea of how popular these units were, uh, I talked to you about the, uh, the Parsons turbine. Uh, in the previous 12 years that Westinghouse had been selling their Parsons turbines, um, they sold about 300,000 horsepower, which, you know, not a small amount. So it's a lot of, a lot of power. Um, but by comparison, in 1903, General Electric had sold almost that same amount of power, uh, about 225,000 horsepower, uh, of the Curtis turbines in just the first 15 months of sales. So 12 years versus 15 months, again, just kind of gives you an idea of that rapid acceleration uh, and growth. Um, when we look at these turbines, they kind of like uh, break it down for you a little bit. Um, when we look at this bottom part, you can see this, this kind of uh, manifold coming in. Um, that's where the steam would have been coming into uh, the turbine and uh, spinning this turbine here on the bottom. Uh, and then the electrical generator, the, the actual generation is, is on the top. And you can see where the wires are coming out and coming down these brass tubes. And these brass tubes would actually go down underground and come back out over here uh, to serve some of this other equipment. We have some two-phase transformers over here. Uh, I mentioned how transportation is very important to Seattle. Seattle and Seattle Electric Company did the Seattle Tacoma Interurban Railroad. Well, this guy right here actually powered uh, the Seattle Tacoma Interurban Railroad. This is a, a 500 kilowatt, uh, 600 uh, volts. Uh, DC uh, motor generator. So they would use the power generated by these turbines to spin a DC motor, which then would spin a DC generator at 600 volts. They didn't have solid state electronics and stuff like that that we have today, so the only way for them, well, maybe not the only way, but the best way anyway for them to, to change that DC to DC was to do these motor generator pairs. Um, one other thing, um, these pumps over here are actually um, for step-bearing oil pumps. Uh, I'm gonna, gonna kind of maybe touch on this a little bit again later, but these vertical units uh, were really cool. They, they save a lot of space in being the, the vertical design, but one of the problems with them was when we put this generator on top of the steam turbine, it puts a lot of weight onto the steam turbine, so they actually had to have this huge uh, step bearing in the middle. There's this huge bearing to kind of keep both of these rotating masses from sort of colliding with each other. Uh, and they had to have a lot of oil and a lot of pressure in order to, to keep these uh, machinery uh, pieces apart. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I want to touch on here. These are oil pumps right here. These are actually vacuum pumps um, with these big red uh, flywheels. Um, these are actually, uh, they're like air compressor vacuum pumps, and what they did is actually help to 
uh, pull the steam through the system. So if you, you follow these pipes up, you can see they're, they're connected to the condensers. Um, you can see this one a little bit better over here. The, the giant thing that looks like a water tower, um, these are our condensers. And then after the steam goes through the turbine, uh, condenses back down into water and it goes back down underneath the plant. These, uh, these air compressors, vacuum pumps, were actually just assisting that whole process with uh, pulling the, the steam through the, the system. So, um, and then the, the, uh, these things on top are kind of cool, the, the, the fly wheel, you know, the, the, the ball governors, uh, kind, of, kind of neat piece of old machinery. Okay, so I'm going to take us uh, up to the, the second floor here. We're going to take the staircase right over here, and uh, we'll continue our tour. All right, so uh, in 1918, a 36-foot expansion was added uh, to the steam plant. Um, on the eastern end of the, uh, the engine house to make room for a, uh, a new uh, 10,000 uh, kilowatt unit or 10 megawatt unit um, <coughs> and related equipment. Uh, that was done in 1919 uh, uh, to produce about as much as the, the same as the first two combined. Does anybody know where that third unit is? <laughs> I know, I know, I'm getting enough trick questions today and now you're afraid to answer, I get it, you know, it's my fault. Um, so, the name point, I, I saw a couple of you uh, reading it, um, is right here. Um, like I said, this unit was uh, 10 megawatts, and as I mentioned, the first unit was originally 3 megawatts, the second one was 8 megawatts, um, combined their day one totals of about 11 for both of these giant units. And uh, this guy right here, you can see how much smaller it is, produces almost the same amount, okay? Um, so, some of the, the pieces of, of equipment to know, um, you know, I pointed out some of the, uh, the steam piping before uh, the condenser is a little bit easier to see now on uh, these, these big pieces of, of equipment uh, here. Um, and uh, also the, the governor valves for uh, that, that turbine here on the bottom, those, those big valves seven up, so I mean, that would have controlled actually the rate of uh, steam flow into there. Um, and in this one, uh, we have the, the steam uh, turbine generator uh, on this side, and then the electrical um, generator part uh, over here. And again, you can see some of the electrical wires uh, on the other side of the unit. Um, when I mentioned the uh, expansion, the 36-foot expansion, you can actually see that on the wall over here uh, on the left side of this pillar, you can see how the concrete looks, and on the right side you can see it's more of a concrete block style. Um, yeah, you, you can see how it, it is a little bit different and they, they expanded this out. One of the things to know is the um, steel corrugated wall behind me. Uh, this is what we call a sacrificial wall. Uh, one of the, the reasons for this was um, if they wanted to expand anything more, they, this wall was easy to take down and just kind of keep building out uh, the steam plant. Uh, but the other reason was because uh, if there were any kind of explosion or accident, uh, the idea was that this is a sacrificial wall and it would be blown out before any of the other uh, things on the steam plant. And there was actually a little bit of an accident like this soon after the steam plant uh, began operation that uh, killed the chief engineer of, of the facility. And it, it got bad enough that Stone and Webster, the original investor of, of the Seattle Electric Company, actually sent some people from Boston to investigate the steam plant problem. Uh, it was kind of a, a big deal. So, Oh, yes. One other thing I love to mention uh, while we're standing right here. When we walk along this path, you'll see the plaque over there that's uh, the ASME uh, plaque is uh, the Society of Mechanical Engineers, and you'll see that's mounted on a really nice, uh, it's a blue marble, it's a Vermont blue marble. Um, what you might not notice, and, and it's, this is probably the best spot to see it, the switchboard on the third floor. If you look at that switchboard closely, you can see that it is also made entirely out of marble. It's Vermont blue marble, um, and it's the, the entire switchboard all the way down. Um, a lot of people have asked me why um, it was like that, and I mean, the, uh, 
Snoqualmie uh, hydroelectric plant, you can actually see some of the, the same examples of it. Uh, my, I think that there are there are kind of two reasons I like to say. Uh, number one, um, it seems like back in that day, everything they built was just built top notch, it's like super classy. Uh, like even the the really nice brass steam gauges and everything just seems to have been built so well. Um, I mean, certainly there's a lot of things that I've seen for that in that era that are just really cool and, and just really well built. Uh, but the other more practical reason that, that I think they used this marble um, was because at the time I don't think that they um, really knew how to insulate electric components as well. You know, today we use metal paintings because we, we understand uh, insulators and grounding everything and making sure that everything is very uh, safe and electrically insulated. Um, but marble is a natural uh, insulator. So they could mount all these electrical pieces onto the marble and not have uh, those electric currents carry from one piece to another and short everything out or you know, have uh, somebody get shocked if they put their hand on it. Um, so those are the, the two reasons I think they used it, but I think it's a, a beautiful uh, piece of equipment. Uh, Alright, so we're going to move the tour uh, into the boiler room and uh, we'll finish up there. Uh, any questions so far? All right, guys, was, is this impressive or what? This is impressive. Yeah. So this is the boiler room that I mentioned. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's these nice little heaters. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, so I mentioned that cool elevator uh, outside. And, you know, if you're going to run a steam plant, you know, what's, what's one of the things that you need? Steam fuel, yeah, exactly, fuel, right? Fuel so uh, when this was originally uh, developed, they actually made this plant uh, to start on oil, but they made it so they could use both oil and coal. And in 1917, around World War I, uh, they switched to coal, and then uh, ended up switching back to oil through a number of years from uh, 1918 uh, through 1946. Um, and if we look up here, you can see these kind of chutes that go down with the, the square covers. Now, the, the coal elevator would have come up right at the, the top center and would have fed coal down these, these chutes and then down through the, the covers and into these, these doors down here um, at the bottom. And you can see there's some patches in the concrete here. There would have been rails in, in the floor with this kind of machinery they call chain grade stokers. Um, kind of like a conveyor belt that would have been feeding coal um, into the, the bottom here. We talked about uh, oil. You have these huge jets, and the, the, uh, you can see there's two entry points in them. Uh, one would have been for coal, and the other one would have been for wow. steam. Um, so, uh, yeah, oil, oh, sorry, I said coal. Uh, one would have been for oil, and one would have been for steam. Um, and when I say uh, oil, I don't want you to think about like the nice stuff that you, you pour into your car, like you know, the nice thin stuff. Uh, I'm talking about like a thick black sludge, just like bunker oil. Uh, and one of the things they would do in order to get the steam plant started uh, was use this pony boiler here at the, the end. And this pony boiler was used just to help get the, the, the fuel warm, um, kind of get it loosened up a little bit and get the, the whole plant started. So they, they would send that oil through, they'd get the first boiler started up, uh, and then just kind of go down the line. <clears throat> um, there are 16 boilers in this room. Uh, manufactured by the Sterling Consolidated Boiler Company, um, rated at about 466 horsepower each. Um, and some people ask me like what the, the crest is on the door, and, and to the best of what I can figure it out, that that is uh, for the the Sterling Boiling uh, Company. Boiling. Yeah, Sterling Boiling Company. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Is it tube and shell? 
Yeah, in fact, you, I mean, you can look in the, the end of the boiler there, the, there's a little viewport there, so if you have a, a light on your phone or something like that, you can actually take a peek uh, inside the boiler and see all the, the tubes. Um, there's also some, some books that you can find online, even on like, uh, Google, Google Docs, about um, the Sterling boilers um, and some of like, how they were constructed. Uh, they call it like the Sterling safety boiler, uh, because you know, there's some of the improvements they, they made to keep it from exploding on people. Uh, so kind of interesting stuff there. Um, so I'm just going to wrap things up here. Uh, you know, certainly we, we talk about the, the steam plant and uh, what to do uh, in the modern day. Uh, in 1951, the Seattle Department of Lighting, uh, now City, Seattle City Light, um, purchased uh, all of Stone and Webster's properties, including uh, the Georgetown steam plant. Um, the last production run was during a major water shortage during the winter of 1952 to 1953. Um, its boilers and generators were only fired up on rare occasions uh, in the years uh, since. For the most part, people just kind of uh, kept it kind of clean, did a test operation once in a while. Um, but the last time that any of them ran was on November 14th, uh, 1974. And um, those units at second vertical and the third horizontal. Um, so, certainly, you know, looking at, um, at, at what to do, uh, Boeing actually wanted to, to tear this down to expand their airport uh, at one point. And uh, the, the story goes that somebody at Seattle City Light, it was an intern actually, uh, looked at this building and said, this building seems pretty cool and there's these really old pieces of equipment here. Uh, and she actually called GE and said, hey, we have these, these two Virtus you know, vertical Curtis, vertical steam Curtis vertical steam turbines. What he said, um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, she said, you know, you know, what what are these things? Can you tell me anything about them? And uh, they said, well, yeah, actually, as far as we know, those are the last two uh, in their originally installed location. Mm -hmm. um, they have one sitting out front of the, the GE facility in Schenectady, you know, rusting outside, you know, from some other place. But as far as like. Being in their original saw locations, these are the last two that are known. Um, and so they said, okay, well, that's that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's kind of a big deal. And in 1984, uh, this was made a National Historic Landmark, which is the, the highest honor of, of National Landmark that, that you can get. Uh, there's only a couple others in Seattle, including the Panama Hotel, Pioneer Square, uh, Fremont Bridge. So collect all seven. Um, <laughs> All right, so you know, certainly we're we're looking at what to do uh, with it now. There, there's um, a, a group that's kind of coming in, you know, an art group where we're looking to, to have it managed a little bit more uh, by the community. Um, do some different things like make it into an art space, make it maybe have it like be a maker space for people. And so, uh, certainly a lot of things in the works, and we you know, certainly love having community involvement. There's a Facebook page uh, if you're inclined to leave a donation or a comment in the uh, the guest book downstairs. Uh, please do so, and uh, Ted and I will be here for other questions if you want to ask us. Thank you very much.